Nature smiled at California after two years of drought. Lake Oroville returned to normalcy, and scientists are astounded as the cause of the comeback is yet to be ascertained. Was it due to human activities? Should the state expect this extent of drought again? Let's delve in to find out. Lake Oroville was built by California State Water Resources back in 1967 to serve as a reservoir, and it turned out to be the second largest in the state after Lake Shasta. It was built due to the empowerment of the Feather River by Oroville Dam back in the day. It was a great decision taken by the government of the 90s because the lake has contributed a lot to the state and its residents. It's about 75 miles north of Sacramento at the Sierra Nevada foothills. It's 744 feet high with 1.62 million acre-feet storage. When it reaches its full capacity, the lake goes as high as 900 feet above sea level. The Feather River Basin's north, middle, west branch, and south fork feed it. The climate in the lake is Mediterranean, with wet winters and hot and dry summers. The coldest months are winter, which falls from December to January, and the average is about 13 degrees centigrade high and 3 degrees centigrade low. The warmest months are in the summer, and it falls between June, July, and August with an average of 35 degrees centigrade high. Now, let's look at why Lake Oroville is highly esteemed and why its drought was a big concern. Lake Oroville is responsible for the Oroville Complex's hydropower facilities, and today it's termed the pillar of the SWP and a major source of flexibility. The downstream discharge of Lake Oroville set by the USACE is 150,000 cubic feet per second north of Honkat Creek, 180,000 cubic feet per second above the mouth of the Yuba River, and 320,000 cubic feet per second. It is the starting point for the state's water project, providing water to approximately 23 million out of the 39 million residents. The water also helps with agriculture, as it's used for irrigation of about 7,500 acres of farmlands. According to Peter Gleick, the President Americus of the Pacific Institute, Lake Oroville, at its full capacity, can supply California residents with water for six months straight. Lake Oroville also plays a huge role in flood management. With no Lake Oroville, California will experience consistent flooding during the wet season, and it'll cause a disaster that includes damage to properties and the death of residents. Speaking of residents, the lake's been a relaxation point not just for the nearby residents but also for tourists. It offers a variety of recreational activities. The visitor center has museums, exhibits, videos, and shops. It also has two high-performance telescopes on the 47-foot tall towers, with which tourists can better look at the lake and the Sierra Nevada, canyons, rolling hills, and Sutter Buttes Mountain. The lake benefits don't end at this view. It also supplied the residents of Oroville and the state in general with fish. According to reports, largemouth, smallmouth, spotted bass, and other species can be caught in the lake. The juicy part is that fishing in the lake is allowed all year round. But it has to be with the California Sport Fishing License. Due to the high level of fish availability in the lake, the California Office of Environmental Health Hazards Assessment, OEHHA, developed a safe eating recommendation based on the level of mercury PCBs in fish caught in Lake Oroville. The authority also allows an all-year-round water skiing, wakeboarding, PWC, and houseboating. To this effect, about five multi-lane boat launches are located at the Bidwell Canyon, Lofa Creek, Spillway, Enterprise, Nelson Bar, Vinton Gulch, Lime Saddle, Foreman Creek, and Dark Canyon. Boating rentals such as canoes, yachts, and paddle wheelers is also available at the Bidwell Marina in the south of the lake and at the Four Bay Aquatic Center in the North Four Bay. Another prominent role Lake Oroville plays for citizens of Oroville and the state in general is housing a fish hatchery. This hatchery manages Feather River's thriving Chinook salmon and steelhead trout population. Before now, several attempts have been made to spawn salmon, shad, and trout artificially in the Feather River and its drainage, but not much progress was recorded. The first hatchery was constructed in 1916, and the Yuba River Shad Hatchery was also built on the Feather River to help reduce the tendency to overfish the shad in the Lower Sacramento River. Still, it was closed not long after, as Shad's first voyage didn't produce enough eggs to fill the river. Another hatchery was built near Curio, Plumas County, 
and it had about 60 hatchery buildings and employees working to ensure that positive results were recorded. The hatchery survived for 30 years. Operations stopped at the site and soon became obsolete. The current hatchery was built by the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Water Resources. The dam blocked the access to upstream spawning grounds for salmon and steelhead. To reduce the impact on fisheries by constructing a barrier and ladder system, to allow adult and steelhead to be caught at the Feather River Farm. The hatchery has two sections. The first is situated on the east side of Table Mountain Boulevard, which includes the anti-fish dam and underwater viewing. The second section is located on the west side of Table Mountain Boulevard. It includes a spawning room, hatchery, and several breeding ponds with fish year-round. The salmon spawning is open for viewing from mid-September to mid-November and a salmon festival is held at the hatchery and downtown Oroville once every year on the fourth Saturday of the same September. During the festival, staff are allowed to work with Chinook salmon to harvest and fertilize the eggs. Has the lake faced any crises since its construction? Oroville Dam experienced heavy rainfall in February 2017, which damaged the dam's main and emergency spillways. As a result, about 180,000 residents were evacuated, and the fish hatchery was also relocated. During the rainfall, the Department of Water Resources DWR, stopped the spillway flow to know the damage's extent and to come to a favorable conclusion on the next action to curb the situation. Unexpectedly, the rain increased the lake level so high that it flowed over the emergency spillway even after they opened the main spillway that had previously got damaged. As the water approached the emergency spillway, the headwood erosion threatened to collapse the concrete weir, which could have resulted in the flooding of the nearby communities. Thankfully, this didn't happen, but the water further damaged the main spillway and eroded the bare slope of the emergency spillway. This ordeal caused the authorities to order evacuation because they suspected the emergency spillway might fail quickly. They noticed that the erosion on the hillside was growing uphill towards the concrete lip of the emergency spillway, and that confirmed their fears. On the 12th of February, the water level went below the top of the emergency spillway, which stopped the emergency spillway from overflowing. Thanks to the reduction in the flow on the emergency spillway, the erosion was speedily examined and stabilized. Quick stabilization was carried out to prevent the flow from transferring to the main spillway, which was previously damaged. If that happens, the repair cost of the main spillway would be on the high side, and it could also lead to damage to the main spillway gates, leaving the water with no control. After the emergency stabilization, the authorities dropped sandbags and large rocks in the area of the dry emergency spillway to protect the base from erosion. Also, about 23,000 National Guardsmen were placed in the area to monitor the erosion and help with the further evacuation. Still, thankfully, on the 14th of the same month, the evacuation order was lifted, which means the people were allowed to return to their various locations. The high level of water influx in Lake Oroville amazed everyone. But what's more terrifying is the rate of drought that occurred on the lake four years after. Lake Oroville wasn't the only lake affected. Other lakes like Lake Shasta and Lake Mead also felt the heat. The lake registered a drastic change in September 2021 the first drought since its construction. According to an eyewitness, Josh Edelson, it was the worst drought the state ever had. The reservoir went low and some areas completely dried up. Joe Peterson, a 52-year-old resident of Oroville, added that the water level went so low that boats couldn't be taken out of it. He also said that fishes were in the remaining parts of the lake, but they couldn't access them. The lake shrank to the extent that it exposed its landscape and hundreds of American artifacts. This incident greatly impacted the state's economy. The power plant, which Oroville Dam powered, shut down due to a short supply of water used to spin the turbines that generate electricity. Carla Nemeth, the director of the state DWR, said that the drought was one of California's unprecedented impacts due to climate-induced drought. According to reports, the decrease of Lake Oroville isn't necessarily the cause of the blackout because the hired power plant, the highest hydroelectric plant in the state, can only generate about 1% of statewide electricity when the lake's in its full form. The real issue is that other reservoirs were affected as well. 
Speaking of other reservoirs affected, Lake Shasta falls into this category. The lake was built to store water from the Sacramento River caused by the Shasta Dam. It's located in Shasta County and is currently the ninth tallest dam in the United States. Like Lake Oroville, Lake Shasta plays a role in flood management. Still, it focuses on the Sacramento Valley downstream of the dam. It generates electricity through the Shasta power plant for irrigation and municipal purposes. Lake Shasta also experienced extreme drought, and according to the report, it's the first time since the last bucket of concrete was poured for Shasta Dam in 1945. Donald Bader, the Bureau of Reclamation's area manager for the Northern California Area Office of the Shasta Dam, said that the lake didn't show a sign of healing even after the city had hundreds of an inch of rain. This drought led to several setbacks. Farmers were forced to rip out crops, and cities imposed fines on households and businesses that used above the required water usage. Lake Mead also experienced drought, just like the others. The lake got its name from Elwood Mead, a U.S. commissioner who supervised the development and execution of the Boulder Canyon project, which resulted in the lake and the dam. Lake Mead is one of the largest artificial lakes in the world and the largest reservoir in California. From reports, its water level began to drop in 2000, affecting the state immensely. It went from full capacity to 38%. According to the Park Service, the park shorelines have been changed due to the drought and the water supply for residents has been lowered to the barest minimum. What is the present condition of the power plant now? Contrary to what the Californians expected, this year turned out to be a blessed one regarding rainfall and snow. The city's been experiencing a good level of rainfall since this year. As a result, hydropower generation at the Hyatt Power Plant in Oroville Dam has resumed work. The water's returned to its colder temperature, which is superb for energy generation. The Department of Water Resources released this news, a relief for the state. The lake is at 860 feet in elevation as of April this year, and the storage is about 2.94 million acre feet, which is 83% of its overall capacity and 115% of its historical average. The lake releases about 7,500 cubic feet per second to the Feather River. It flows through the city of Oroville at 1,000 cubic feet per second. It also releases into the Thermalito Afterbay outlet, which gives it a total of 7,500 cubic feet per second. Reports show that the power plant uses one generating unit to produce energy and supplies it to the state's electrical grid, which the California Independent System operator manages. It was also gathered that the outflow of water from the plant wouldn't be as high as before, at least for the moment, because the rate of agricultural practice reduced as the drought began. DWR also stated that they're looking for an average of 900 cubic feet per second of outflows, and by their estimation, it'll generate approximately 30 megawatts of power. Director Carla Nemeth said the new development is a significant milestone. He added that providing clean hydropower to the state energy grid will help them provide the state with sufficient energy. The DWR has been serious about meeting the state's energy goal. They completed major maintenance activities while the power plant was shut down to ensure its reliability when work resumes. Their action was the right step in the right direction. After measurement in April, DWR discovered that the lake measured 91% and they announced that the state water project would be delivering 100% allocation. Californians well received this news, as it was the first time since 2006. The power plant isn't the only facility that benefited from the return of the lake. The arid landscapes have been filled with water, waterfalls have resumed gushing, and farmers no longer depend on underground water for irrigation. They currently use brimming canals that have more water than they need. The Department of Water Resources is taking steps it's working consistently to restore everything to normal, from water supply to citizens to irrigation of farmlands. Still, the question remains, will the state be experiencing this extent of drought soon? What do you think about the roller coaster nature of lakes in California? Do you think the state will survive another long-term drought? Tell us in the comment section.